testing. Welcome. Okay. Hello, hello. All right. Hey, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, cool. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, this is our biggest meetup yet. Just get bigger and bigger every month. This is really exciting. Uh, just a shout out to our sponsors at TAS for Brighton, providing food and a place for us to meet. And also to O'Reilly for uh, some books. Actually, I got some books in the mail from him today, so I'm going to raffle off a couple of them. Um, uh, we've got two speakers tonight, uh, Jason Dobry, and then after him, we've got Nick Sigmiller. And then feel free to hang around afterwards, and I'll do a raffle, and you guys can hang out and talk or whatever. So turn over to Jason. Can you hear me? Good. Lavender. He said lavender. Oh, yeah, I two guests. Yep. It's really spotty, so I apologize if you can't get on. We good? Cool. Uh, like Matt said, my name is Jason Dobry. I work at Lendio. This is a product placement. Um, last time I presented here, we had about half as many, maybe a third as many people in, in a much much smaller room, so it's a lot more comfortable here. Um, I, today I want to talk about data and how, they, how you manage your data in your Angular apps. Just a quick show of hands, how many of you are just starting Angular, like maybe today? A couple of you. How many of you are here for the first time at AngularJS Utah? Wow. Um, how many of you have been using Angular for a couple months, a few months? And how many of you, how many of you are like Angular gurus? <laughs> You're out there, I'm sure of it. Um, so I've been using Angular for about a, a little more than a year. Um, I enjoy working on open source Angular projects. One of mine is Angular Cache, have any of you used Angular Cache? It's, uh, it's a library for, it's a replacement for the Cache Factory service that Angular has, and it has a lot more features like cache, cache expiration and tools like that, local storage integration. Um, that's pretty much what I talked about last time I presented here, and I hinted that I was mo starting a new project that was going to tackle the more difficult data issues Interfacing with the RESTful interface, um, some of the things that ng resource uh, tries to do. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today is um, <coughs> Angular, Angular data. Has anyone here used Ember data? Two, three people, not very many. Um, Ember data is the companion project to the Ember framework. And Ember data has, was built to um, handle all of your client-side model needs, and it was built to interface with a very standard RESTful interface, kind of like Ruby and Active Record things. Um, Angular data is kind of my analog to Ember data for Angular. Um, with Ember, you very often are decorating your data, wrapping them in Ember's classes, custom objects. In Angular, we love this philosophy where our data is very clean, POJOs. You just pull POJOs from your server and you stick them on the scope, they get bound to your view, and it's really fast and easy. So one of the kind of design, design des decisions around Angular data was to not touch your data, um, but to let, it, it just remains as a POJO within Angular data, and Angular data just maintains its own metadata, is what we'll call it, about your data in order to um, track changes and know when things have been updated and things like that. So we're just going to start from the beginning. I've never tried this before, but apparently you can go to that URL and it might like flip your slides for you or something while I'm flipping through my slides. I don't know if anyone wants to try it. It's slides.com slash jdobry slash angularjs dash respect dash your dash data slash live. No, I'll try it. <clears throat> so. Scope, for any of you who aren't familiar with what scope is, scope is how the data that's in your JavaScript gets bound to the HTML, to your view. And Angular will 
keep track of your data, and as it changes, it will update your view for you. It's the two-way data binding that is all the rage among today's frameworks. Um, is, er, scope is really handy as an abstraction for getting your data into the view. It's really simple to just uh, use the dot operator to set the total or the cost on a JavaScript object and have it automatically updated for you in the view. It's really handy, but it's limited in that scope doesn't handle things like retrieving your data from various data sources, your RESTful API, IndexedDB, wherever you're getting it from, uh, deserializing it. You might have some sort of custom response object that you use at your company with standard response codes and things like that. Um, so you need to change it. You need to pull that POJO out of that response object, transforming the data however you might need to do that, caching it, saving data once you've made changes, uh, refreshing data, destroying data, just overall managing the life cycle of your models as they, as they go back and forth between the browser and the server. Also, there are just a lot of different APIs that you need to be worrying about when you're working with your data. When you, start, when you first start a project, there's not much there. You put some stuff on the scope. It shows up in the view. It's nice and fun. But as your project grows, you start adding more resources and more models and more routes and more controllers and more directives. And pretty soon, you've got maybe dozens of routes with dozens of different models that are coming from your back end to your client. And what you end up with is a lot of boilerplate. As, you, as the complexity of your app grows and you're managing more data, you're trying to stay dry. You're trying to not repeat yourself as much as possible. So you start to write your own abstractions that help you manage your data. Um, one of them is a service. Instead of just using like the dollar sign HTTP service directly in your controllers, you start using factories and services to build your own model layer, one of those layers that Angular doesn't come with out of the box. Um, so do you really want to write all of that stuff yourself? Write all of those abstractions? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> it's just a lot of work. And uh, some of these things are hard to get right and take a lot of trial and error. So, but we're going to try it. <clears throat> so your app starts. It's this nice little seedling app. Perhaps you used a uh, yeoman or a generator that gave you uh, someone's opinion of how it should be set up. And this is what you think it's going to end up like. It's going to be this beautiful, organized tree of an app that never has any problems. But this is what it ends up like. Just to <laughs> is ugly. You're not happy with how you have to maintain it. And it's really hard to make changes because you got to touch all these different files. <clears throat> when you need to add a new route or a new resource, it's just a pain. Maybe it looks like this. There actually weren't very many pictures of ugly trees. I was, I was surprised. I figured there'd be more. <laughs> so here's a simple example. Um, this is just kind of an abstraction of what your Angular app might have. I haven't put any of the views in here because we're just talking about data. But let's say you've got maybe two controllers because you have two routes. And these routes display maybe some users, their posts, and their comments. Maybe this is like a little forum type thing. So you've got two routes, and they need to pull data, the users' posts and comments, from the server. Um, the DB, that just represents the server. And they're communicating via HTTP. That's the, the bus between your client and the, the server. So at the very, very beginning, you might just inject the HTTP service directly into your controller and make the get or post or whatever request to the server and get the data straight back in your controller. When you swap between the two controllers, like they, the user moves from one, one route to the other, the data that was in the first controller is lost. It is uh, garbage collected, basically. And then the second <coughs> controller, when it boots up, it makes its request for its data. So the app is a little chatty at this point. It just made, it's making an HTTP request for each controller as it boots up. You might have where the users are just the same user to, users are displayed or used in both controllers. So you're wanting to share data or state between these two controllers. And uh, that's the problem we're, we're going to solve here in a minute. This uh, example app grows in complexity as you uh, increase the size of your app. It's a little contrived because pretty much everything displays users, but 
uh, you're at, you get the idea. You're adding various combinations of different resources of yours being displayed in different views that your app um, has. Here's a definitely more complex example. Not only do we have these five different routes that display different combinations of our, our, our models, um, we have different data sources where we're trying to retrieve data. We've got HTTP. We're trying to communicate with a, our back end. We're trying to pull data out of local storage. Who knows how it got there? Or IndexedDB. Uh, maybe we're trying to do some sort of offline functionality for our app. And at this point, each of our controllers is getting a little messy as each controller tries to worry about how and from where it's getting its data. Um, so the very first technique that a lot of people dive into with trying to manage their data is they want to build a service layer. This is where you pull those, the, the logic of retrieving your data and trying to share data, but share state between controllers. You pull that into a service layer. And very often, your services are going to be singleton-type objects, so they survive between route changes. And so here I've got a, a service layer. And this abstraction creates a, a different service for each model or each resource that the app uses. The user service will be responsible for retrieving users from wherever they are, the server, local storage, index DB. That has been abstracted away from the, the controller. And at this point, the controller can just declare that it needs the user's resource. Um, one way to do that is in the route provider. This is uh, the service that you use to declare your routes. It has a resolve attribute that you can set on it. And the resolve attribute is a list of dependencies that need to be injected in, or need to be resolved before that controller can be created or instantiated. So in the resolve portion of the route provider, when you declare, for example, this first route that needs users, in the resolve, you can inject the user service and have the user service retrieve the users. It's an asynchronous function, retrieving users from your server. And what happens is Angular will wait to instantiate that controller until those users have arrived. So when your controller boots up, it's guaranteed that the users have already been retrieved. That's a quick example. And that means the controller has now been decoupled with, from, it's been decoupled from the location of the users like, and, and how to retrieve them. The controller doesn't need to worry about that anymore. It's now a responsibility of the user service. And that separation makes it easier for you to maintain the app and to extend it further as you add more, res more resources and more services. <clears throat> this grows a bit complex. Um, as you write you know, your fifth and sixth and eighth services, you're starting to realize that you're sharing a lot of code between them. They all have the same structure. You have like a method that is the find and the find all and the update and the delete. Just the, the cred methods that you use often with a RESTful-like API. And so you might create like a base service that is more like an abstract class that you use to um, then create a bunch of child services that share that boilerplate code. This base service might then have its own abstractions where it tries to swap out the different um, transports that it uses to retrieve data. That way you can quickly and easily switch between pulling data from the server via HTTP or loading it in an, off from, in an offline mode from IndexedDB or web storage. And these, the service layer is growing and getting bigger and more complex as you try to stay dry and to manage your data in a sane and maintainable way. So it was to solve this problem that I started the Angular Data Project. From, and I was, I was mostly inspired by what I saw in Ember Data, though I thought Ember Data was really strict in how it forced you to structure your API in a certain way. Of course, with Angular Data, I've made some assumptions, but I've tried to make it as flexible as possible. So enter Ember, Angular Data. Now, <laughs> Angular Data becomes the service layer between your controllers and your views and your data sources. So with Angular Data, um, it becomes the abstraction that allows your, your Angular app, the part that has your controllers and your views, Angular Data provides the data for your controllers. 
under the hood, the way Angular Data works is you declare your resources, you tell Angular Data about them, and it maintains some simple meta information so it understands, for example, what endpoint it needs to make the GET request on in order to retrieve your data. And that is handled by various adapters that can be swapped in and out, so you can just change what data source you're pulling data from. You could initially, when your app boots up, use the IndexedDB adapter and just pull data from an offline storage type deal. And then you might do some processing, like, is my data there? Maybe I'm going to tell my server like what version of data I have. And if it's out of date, like, swap over to the HTTP adapter and pull data right from the server and get it refreshed. And so this abstraction has been built such that you can just add an infinite number of resources if you want. And the boilerplate of managing 100 different resources is managed by Angular Data. Um, the API of Angular Data is hopefully familiar in that it has find, find all, create, update, destroy, crud-like methods. They're all asynchronous. That means you call the method, but it might take a little, there's some latency between when you call the method and when its callback is executed. In the case of Angular Data, it uses Angular's promise service. So all of the, all of the asynchronous, asynchronous methods of Angular Data are promise driven. So there's a latency between when you call find or find all and when the data returns from the server. At that point, the data as it comes back from the server is injected into the store. That means it's available to you. Uh, it's available for you to interact with that data using Angular Data's synchronous methods. That the route provider resolve that I mentioned when you declare your routes, you could use Angular's asynchronous find method to retrieve the data when someone tries to visit a route for the first time. And then in your controller itself, you use a Angular Data's synchronous get method to pull the data right out of the data store because it's already there. It's guaranteed to be there. And Angular Data, as part of its internal workings, it maintains knowledge about when the last time your data changed and when the last time it was saved to the server. So in your controller, you could use a watch function, which is how you watch data for changes. And you can watch the last modified timestamp of that data of yours in the controller. And then every time that data changes, however, or wherever it changed, you can get the latest copy of that data from the data store in your controller. And I'll show an example of that here in just a sec. Or right now, I guess, is the answer to that question. Please zoom in. Here we go. Here's an example. Does that look good? OK. So right here, on the scope of my controller, I declare a watch. And often, you'll pass in a string as the first argument, which is an expression. You're telling the scope what expression to watch for changes. In this case, this function returns the value that is to be watched. So the data store has a last modified method. You tell it which resource, and then you tell it the ID of the item to watch. So I know the ID of the series. In this case, it's the series, whatever that is. I know the ID because it's in the parameters of the URL of the page that I visited. It, visited. So every time that last modified timestamp changes, every time that number changes, this second callback will be executed. <laughs> and what I do in this series is I use this synchronous method of the data store to pull that series object right out of the data store. And in this sense, I can immediately have the latest changes of that object available to me at any time. Use cases where that is really useful. You're using Pusher or GoInstant or PubNub or something to basically create your own version of three-way data binding in your app. You have multiple clients open, multiple browsers, and you maybe have multiple users editing some of the same objects. One user makes a change. You want the user in his other browser to see that change immediately. So I guess maybe Firebase coined the term, I don't know, three-way data binding. It syncs between browsers. So you can implement that, implement that yourself. Um, here's an example of a message service that uses Go Instant. So the, the key is you have channels, and you, you, you publish messages or events on the channels. So in this case, um, there's a channel. And what happens is 
every time there's a create event, um, it executes the callback for the create event. And my create event looks at the payload. And in this case, I just specified the payload because I created the event. But the payload tells me what the resource was and what the ID of the item was. And if my browser cares about that resource and that item, I can immediately just call find on that item. And the data store will retrieve it from the server. It'll get injected into the store and be available to me pretty soon. Go ahead. So how do you know that the ID is the same instead of a set of parameters that tells you? So back over here, um, the ID or primary key of the item doesn't change. The timestamp of when it was last modified is maintained by Angular Data. Under the hood, Angular Data uses Observe.js, which is the, um, what do you call it, the poly polyfill for um, the object.observe. So if your browser supports object.observe, <coughs> under the hood, Angular Data is already using it um, ahead of the curve. And it has a polyfill, so in all the other browsers, it works. I've throttled Angular Data's dirty checking to be um, like a tenth as um, resource intensive as Angular's own dirty checking cycle. So it, will, it won't slow your app down as it checks um, your data for changes. In addition, when it finds that changes have happened to your data, that's when it updates that timestamp. So in your scope's watch function, that, that timestamp would change, and you get the latest copy of the data. And now you can even ask Angular Data what changes happened, and it'll give you a diff object, so you can know how the object changed. That might be useful to some of you. Angular Data has a website. where I have the API documentation for Angular Data pretty well done. It's not 1.0 yet. I'm still fleshing out some of the final features. Right now, I'm working on designing how to do relationships and associations and nested resources. Um, but other than that, it's ready to be used in all of your personal projects. And I encourage you to, because I could use a lot of feedback on improving it. The basic, uh, the overview is um, basically what I've already shown. The asynchronous methods are what you use to communicate with your data sources. Retrieve data, save data, destroy data. The synchronous methods are analogs to the asynchronous methods. The synchronous ones are what you use to interact directly with the data that's already in your data store. Um, more examples of that are that message service I mentioned. If a browser over here, the user deletes an item, then it publishes that delete event with the resource type and what its ID was. And this browser over here gets that message, and it can check and see, is that thing in my data store right now? If so, just kick it out, eject it. And it's gone, and it disappears from the view because you have that scope watch happening. It'll recognize that the item just disappeared from the data store. Does anyone have any questions? Go ahead. So just yesterday, I added integration to Angular Cache so that you can configure things like expiration for the items that are in, your, in the data store. That way, it doesn't just continuously keep growing and getting bigger and bigger. Um, that way, it can maintain a so, sort of size and not eat up your, browser, your browser's memory. Um, so yes, it does have Angular Cache integration if you want to use Angular Cache. How much control do you have over the different uh, like types of data that you have? I mean, does this kind of require you to, to have written the REST API yourself so, so that it follows a, like a consistent pattern across all of your users, code, comments, et cetera? Um, basically, its only requirement is that every resource you define needs to have some sort of primary key to be used within the data store. Other than that, it can have whatever schema it wants. Um, I'm, I'm debating adding some sort of schema validation component to Angular Data where it could do that for you, like Ember Data does out of the box. But some people might just want to use their own validation library. For that, Angular Data has a life cycle that each of its models go through. So if you call the create method and you pass it a hash of attributes that you want to be created on the server, it goes through a life cycle where it first calls a before validate 
then a validate function, then an after validate, then a before create. And by default, they're all no ops, but you can override them with your own hooks and you could write your own validation function and it'll be called before that is actually tried, to, before Angular data tries to save that data to the server. And then finally, there'll be like an after create function that's called once it's done being created. So that way you could hook into the various pieces, uh, various steps in the life cycle of your, of your models. And similarly, there's before update, after update, before destroy, after destroy, things like that. If you wanted to have a single place with reusable logic that needs to happen every time an object is destroyed from your data store. Um, one thing I want to build is a Chrome extension that gives you a view into the, into the data store. Ember data, Ember has the Ember inspector, and if you load the Ember inspector when you have on an Ember app that has Ember data, it'll give you a table view of all your resources and their schema right in Chrome. So you know exactly what's in your data store, what it looks like. I want to have something just like that for Angular data. Good question. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, the workload you explained is something that can be from cache to the directory that's consumable to break it down that little bit so it doesn't get too right. double. But is that just really out of the box from Angular data, or is that like a bunch of connectors? And stuff? It won't do the syncing for you, but the adapters are there. So you could tell the data store to retrieve the data from HTTP, and then you have it save it to IndexedDB. And then maybe the next time the app boots up, you have it check IndexedDB first, or maybe refresh the data with some worker type process. So the tools are there, but I didn't want to enforce a, a process like that on people. I just recently am created and I'm still testing a local forage adapter. So if anyone knows Mozilla's, Mozilla's local forage project, it's a key value store like API on top of web storage, IndexedDB, Web SQL, so that one is going to be available really soon. I think so too, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so it needs some feedback just because um, it's still not 1.0, and it's I've been implementing features one after another. We actually we already use it where I work. It works very well. Um, it's when we were at ng-conf and demoing our app, we had the 3A data binding going strong. So we had two monitors, so you could change stuff on one and see it update instantly on the other. And it's really not a lot of code to just inject the data store, define your posts, your comments, your users, and at that point, you're just calling find, find all, and they're available to you in the data store automatically. It caches all of your responses by default. And it remembers if you made a certain type of find all query with certain parameters. Um, and so the next time you make that same query again, you'll get that same result set back. Angular data has an internal filter that it will use to filter the data the same way your backend filtered it when it gave you the response. And that's all overridable too. So you'll either A, need to configure your backend to understand the query language that Angular data uses, or B, Use your server's query language that you already have and tell Angular data how it works. So you just do one or the other, whichever one you want to do first. What am I doing on time? Am I about good? Any other questions? Yes. Actually, if you do have time, I'd like to see like you just uh, maybe you have example on here, but defining a resource. Yeah. So right here, here's an app. So here I define a few resources. Um, you really only have to give it the name. That's the only required field. And it'll infer other things. Bigger? OK. Um, you can specify endpoint if the endpoint is different than the name of the resource. There are various other things you can configure. Here's an example of defining an after create function. So that gets executed every time a comment gets created. That will be executed. And uh, you could have you know, the validate, before validate, various things like that. I wanted to show an example of a route that has a resolve. So here's one. It, there's the URL. This resolve hash, each one of these is a dependency that needs to get resolved before this controller can be instantiated. So right here, the data store gets injected. And what I tell it to do is to find 
which ends up being a get request to the URL that is configured for that resource. And it comes back with its response. And I don't have the nested resources yet. So that's why I have to manually inject its user relation that it came up with into the data store. That way, they're both put into the, the right place of the data store. But when I have relations, the series and its child user object will hopefully be injected into the correct place by the data store. And it'll understand those relations. So when that controller gets instantiated, that series object will be, it's guaranteed to be there. And since Angular Data recognizes the next time this route is hit, that that series object with its primary key already exists in the data store, it will just immediately return with that object. It'll still be asynchronous because of the promise, but it'll just be really fast. So any other questions? And if, if you have any more questions after about implementation <coughs> examples, um, feel free to come talk to me after. I, uh, I want to build an example app that covers as many possible use cases as possible just to showcase the different ways to do these different things with Angular Data. Cool. Thanks. Okay, I am going to sit down so you can see it because I got a lot of code I want to go through. Do we want to take the time to do this? It's free and it installs in seconds. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is ng-animate. So just to get some idea of where everyone's at, who's, who's used ng-animate in some capacity or another? That's maybe not as many as I was expecting, but that might be good. So I'm going to give you a high-level view of kind of how it works, uh, um, how, how to plug it in. There's lots of different ways to use it. There's a lot of options. And there's an even larger number of gotchas in ng-animate. And as I've been using it in our uh, app over the last year or so, I've, I've come up with a lot of those. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is uh, Nick Segmeller. Um, and I work at Vivint, like two buildings over here. Uh, we're actually hiring, so let me know if you need a job. Um, and um, if you want to follow along, all of my code is here on GitHub and my GitHub page, Unsegmeller Angular Examples. Uh, you can also get the code from my talk two months ago um, about routes when he was talking about how to use resolve inside of a route. That was my, a topic I spoke here uh, just a little while ago. So let's see, let's install this plugin real quick. Seems like too much work. There we go. 
Owen? Okay. I assume that's doing something. <clears throat> so here's the, the, the sample project that I've made here. Um, I'll make it a little bit bigger. So what I've done is I've got a handful of examples and I'll be tweaking some of the code as we go here um, and, and walking you through some of the code. So let me big in this a little bit. That's probably good enough. Okay, so just to show you some examples, um, this is a very classic NGF, um, and that's literally just taking an element in and out of the DOM. And you notice they've got a nice little fade effect going on there. I'll show you the examples and we'll kind of go through them all. NG include, so this is actually a sub document I have here. So if you come over here, I've got this page right here, sub doge. So that's being uh, NG included on that page. There's an NG show, which is like an NGF, except instead of actually adding or removing it from the DOM, it just applies a, a class to it that sets its vis uh, display flag to none. So that one looks exactly the same, but I'm using a keyframe animation. I'll go through that. Here's actually changing views. So this is going from other page back to the dashboard at the top there. Um, an animation that's a little bit more complicated. An animation that has lots of stuff going on. So, so just to start off, we'll start with the, the most simple example here. So in our dashboard here, um, I've got some very simple code, and all it does is it toggles a couple of uh, variables that I've dropped into my scope. So I've got an NGF, and I've got a scope variable called NGF. So the key here, the way this works as of Angular 1.2 and the 1.teens releases, ng-animate was a lot more complicated, and they made it a lot simpler. It's really based around just having a class on it that behaves like it's supposed to. So if we go over to the um, CSS and begin, you can see this is the first, the first one that I'm using there. It's just a basic fade in and out. So this is the part where it immediately starts being unintuitive to, I think, everyone. And kind of, once you can kind of wrap your head around some of this stuff and get an idea of what it's actually doing, it starts to make a lot more sense. So I'm going to start with this a pure CSS example, and then down below I start using Compass and, and SAS, uh, Sassy CSS um, because I find it a lot better to use for these kind of examples. So the basic idea here is that when, a, in, in, in the case of ng-if, when it's being added to the DOM, Angular is going to apply a class of ng-enter to it, and then immediately after that it's going to apply another class of ng-enter active. And basically that one will run, and the and it's, so it's a, basically a start and an end destination, and then when that animation finishes, it will remove both of those classes. When it's leaving the DOM, it will apply a class of ng-leave, and then ng-leave active, and then it'll run until it's done, and then it will remove it from the DOM. So what you can see here is in both the enter and the leave phase, I'm saying I want to do a 0.5 second transition. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, in the case of enter, and really how you have to read this is, I start at opacity zero, and I go to opacity one. So basically you can think of the enter condition as, you know, like I said, the starting point. And this is the destination or what it's going to, to go to. So you can put your setup code in here. And notice I put, you know, I could have this code, it could just be duplicated across those two blocks. Uh, I do that kind of down below, whatever feels nice. So same thing with leaving, I'm gonna go from one to zero. And so of course back over here, you can see that that's really all it's doing um, is as I click this, it just, you know, does a fade in. So just to kind of show you how that's actually working behind the scenes, if I make this a much longer transition, oops. Um, and then we pull open the inspector here. So what we'll see You can see it's got the ng animate, and then you see ng enter, ng interactive on that class right there. And you see as soon as it finished the animation, they disappeared. And of course, when I remove it, you'll see the, the opposite. So you see the ng leave, the ng leave active. So at, at a base level, with a simple ng if, this is probably the most simple way to do it, the most simple example. 
Um, and it's really easy, really straightforward. Um, and ng, ng includes are actually very, very similar. And actually, you can tell I'm using the exact same animation on it. So if we come back over here and look at my dashboard again, which is gone. <laughs> That's really friendly. Um, so you can see that my ng include is actually using the same class, fade in out, fade in out, and it works in both places. So now we're going to start getting into the really heavy gotchas. So as I showed you in the CSS, man, it wants exactly a specific number of files open at once. So it, 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 it applies these very specific classes, ng enter and ng leave. If you look at the documentation for ng-animate, you can see that depending on the directive in play, the supported animations are different. So all of these just use a basic enter and leave. So that's what I showed you, the ng-include, ng-switch, or ng and ng-if. So ng-show and hide are different. They use add and remove, and this is based around classes. So basically, like I said, since ng-show and ng-hide do nothing more than add a class, they just add a class that's saying, this display is none, or it removes that class that says this display is none. It follows that paradigm. So if we look at the code for this ng show here um, in the dashboard, I've got a slightly different one. I've called it fade show. And we come back over to our animations. And here I've switched over to compass CSS, which again I find a little bit more friendly. This syntax is the analog of this here. So it's just a way to kind of shorten uh, your CSS. If you're not using a free processor in your CSS, just do that. If you listen to nothing else I say, then do that. Yeah, question. Okay. So, so the, the so the trick on this one. Oh, sorry, it's this one here. So again, I've got some basic setup code, and then since I'm using Compass, I can define a, a single line. That single line turns into those two lines effectively to set the transition time. So then the key here, and this is where it gets super weird, is that instead of having, instead of it applying an ng enter uh, and an ng enter active, it actually is based on the class that it's going to apply. And since an ng hide or an ng show applies an ng add or an ng, the ng hide class, so removing an ng hide is basically something being shown, which is why I have it at the top and the, it's the analog of uh, an enter into an ngf. And conversely, the ng hide being added is going to hide it or like remove it like above, so it's the analog to the ng leave. So you basically have an ng hide add, an ng hide remove, and then you have an active version of both of them. Now one thing you might notice here is that I have a display block of important on both of these. Does anybody have any idea why I would need that? Yeah, that's the basic idea, and, and that's again, remember that what in, the class ng-hide itself is setting its display to none. So if I don't override that here, then it will just immediately apply, and this doesn't show or do anything. So you have to override that for the length of the animation, and then it will get set to none when it's done. So um, ng-show, like I said, probably one of the most convoluted ones when you're first starting out, but uh, as far as animations go for one of the more common uh, cases in, in Angular. So next example is, is a basic keyframes animation. And uh, keyframes uh, are very similar, but ever so slightly different at the same time. So again, I've just got a single class I'm applying, a keyframe fade. If we come over to our animations here, you can see I've defined my keyframes. They're the simplest ones I could possibly imagine. Um, all I'm doing is I'm saying, you know, go from zero to one opacity, and it's just going to do a linear uh, transition because I haven't told it to do anything else. Um, and so I've got both a fade in version of the keyframes and a fade out version of the keyframes. Here is the actual classes. Uh, when you're dealing with uh, animations versus transitions, you don't actually need the active classes. Uh, that is completely handled by the animation. So in this case, I just have the ng enter, I just have the ng leave, and all they do is run their individual versions. So it's the same story. It applies the class. It'll put on the ng enter. It runs the animation out, and then it removes from the DOM or comes into the DOM. Uh, next, we got the one to change views. So when I change views, this is actually animating um, uh, the ng view. So if you look here, 
It's in my index rather. So here's my ng view. Here's the class that is triggering the ng animate. And the opacity fade is just a very, very basic, you know, it's a slightly different variation. I think it's a CSS or a, a SAS version of this one. So same thing again, uh, it's using a SAS variable, slightly truncated syntax. So here's another one of the, the famous gotchas of ng-animate. Notice that when I do this, the doge fades out, but then the other one pops in. And when I go forward, it's the same thing. Fades out, the doge pops in. Yeah. Is that because the doge needs to be position absolute? Yes. Why does it need to be position absolute? Yeah, that's a, exactly. That's exactly right, and that's like without a doubt one of the biggest gotchas of ng-animate, especially when it comes to views, is that both of the two views, while they're animating, live in the DOM at the same time, and that's what actually makes them both show. And when you think about it conceptually, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense, but it can really bite you as you're as you're working on it. So if I click the go back here, and we come over here, hopefully I'm fast enough, but you can see there's one ng view, here's a second ng view. Um, and that's why. So if we come back over to this and we do an ever so simple position absolute on these, um, let's actually turn the animation time back on. Then we can see that they properly crossfade. And, and that will, like, I'm like he said, that one bit me like so many times. I, and it's bitten me lots of times in general. Um, and if you ever start using like display table cells, they'll both live in the DOM and suddenly you have two table cells and like, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing to note is as I'm using this with ng view in the index here, uh, it works also if you're gonna use Angular UI's router, it works exactly the same way with the UI router. So. Um, I switched over to that and I'll never look back. It's so much better than the Angular router. <laughs> uh, so, so at this point, I'm gonna take a slight shift. So that's the basic idea of, of CSS. So that's the kind of foundational level, you know, here's how it works for a basic set of examples and so on. Does anybody have any questions so far before I continue on the next piece? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it has a couple of things, and I don't know that I can explain it perfectly, but the basic idea, like I said, is it's going to apply um, those classes, like the ng-enter class, the ng-enter active class, and then it's actually watching, you know, listening for your animation to finish, and then when it does, it's going to remove the classes for you, and then, so basically, it, it holds up adding or removing it to the DOM based on that animation finishing. So, I mean, at a, at a very simple high level, that's what it's doing. There's more details on that, I'm sure. Question in the back? So, so in, if, you, if you don't, then it won't, you know, because the whole idea is that you want it to animate as it's coming into the DOM or as it's leaving the DOM. So sure, you could like recreate all this work yourself, but like, why, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and I mean, I've written in the past directives that do nothing more than watch for an animation to finish or watch for a transition to finish. That's all they do and they have a callback function. And then ultimately I realized that I was kind of trying to recreate the same behavior. So what's the point? So the next thing I want to jump into is how to use ng-animate with JavaScript animations. Uh, if you look through, uh, there's a great article here, uh, Year of Moo. Uh, if you are in anything to do with Angular and you don't just subscribe to the blog, you're doing it wrong. Great stuff on here all the time. Uh, just a very recent post on the new ng messages that's coming up in the next version of Angular. So really good stuff on here. But so he, he covers in this article, you know, he goes through all of this and then he gets down into uh, third-party JavaScript libraries. So I'm going to talk about one of those today. It's green sock, and if you look at, uh, they have some great performance comparisons between green sock, jQuery, and CSS. The short answer is that green sock does very well. It destroys jQuery and makes jQuery animations look stupid, and it does almost as well as CSS in just about everything but 3D, anything that can be that CSS can offload to the graphics card effectively. And, and even in those cases, in my experience, it does a very admirable job. Yeah. Um, in yeah, 
So it, it, it basically, like, I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for that yet. So in, in my experience, when, when I, we, we were told that we had to support IE9, and all of my beautiful CSS animations and CSS transitions made me sad, and so I looked at this tour as a replacement, and it, it runs, in my experience, as well as the pure CSS animations for pretty much everything I was doing. Um, so that being the case, let me show you how to plug it in. And, and some of the reasons that you might want to. So um, I have a very simple one for this ng if. I'm just going to switch over to use, um, it's just called, let's see, this dashboard here. So instead of fade in out, we're going to use fade in out JS. And I promise you that's a JavaScript animation. <laughs> so as you can see, it does that. Yay, right? And if you don't believe me, it's a JavaScript animation. Uh, let's look at the actual item here um, and watch. Can you, did you see it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's running the opacities through um, in JavaScript. You can't see me pointing at my screen. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a JavaScript animation that does the same thing. So let's go look at how that's implemented. So the way you declare these is I usually make uh, another folder inside of my scripts folder and basically, you bring them in like you would a directive, a service, a control, or anything else. So, uh, oh, the other thing that I probably should have mentioned really, really early on is that um, ng animate's not part of the core, like ng route. So make sure you include ng animate in your uh, module instantiation of your app. Um, again, here, like I just build my animations in their own little submodule, and then as I add them, I uh, put them into that module. So here is the, that fade in out in JavaScript. Uh, so it's a very similar case of before where it's going to look for an enter, uh, an enter function and a leave function. And it's going to, and these are the arguments that get passed in, it's the element that's being operated on and it's basically the callback function to happen at the end. So in this case, tweenmax is the, uh, the large all things included version of the, of the GSAP library. There's a tween light and you can kind of bundle specific pieces that you want into it as well. So basically all it's saying is, and I've got a from to, which lets me specify a you know, beginning and a destination. You can also just tween to something. You can tween just from something. It's actually pretty cool. So element to operate on, how long. I've got it set in this one to 0.3 seconds. And then from and to. So go from opacity 0 to opacity 1. So really straightforward. It's, this is another gotcha if you're first starting to do JavaScript here, is that so Greensock has a callback to run on complete of the animation. And you have to make sure you pass through uh, Angular's own done callback. Otherwise, it will not work, I promise. <laughs> so make sure you don't forget that one in there as well. So and again, uh, another one of these big old gotchas, especially when you get into ng show and ng hide, since you're actually adding and removing a class, um, the, the callback functions are actually remove class and not add class. You have to do it before add class. So in the case of adding the class, you're adding the ng hide, but before you do that, you have to set up what's going on uh, in your animation. Like, just seriously, not intuitive at all. I banged my head against that one for a really long time. The other thing, when you're actually removing it, so this is when it's coming into existence, you have to remove the ng hide off of it and actually then run your animation through in that case. So, um, and as you can see, this fade in out JS because I've, I've given it all of these functions, will work for almost any single directive at this point. And this is, this is literally one that I have in my production code, this exact JavaScript file, because it's such a common one to just want something to fade in or out uh, as you do stuff. Um, so that's a, an overly simple example. So let's go back to this one. And this is one of the places where uh, JavaScript animations really shine and uh, CSS kind of falls apart. So if we turn this one back off, and we have a multi-part animation. So as you can see, that one's actually doing th three different things. It fades in, it translates as it rotates to the right, and then it translates down. And that's three things in step. Um, if you've ever tried to stack up uh, CSS animations or CSS transitions, it, I'm, you, know, you can do it, don't get me wrong. It's just not exactly the world's simplest endeavor. So uh, if we look at this first uh, version of our multi-part here, I've done this the simplest way I can possibly imagine, and I just have three different calls here, and the on complete for each one runs into the next one. 
Um, you can do this. If you look into GreenSock, they have a whole concept of a timeline. And you can actually put different animations on a timeline. You can play the timeline forward. You can pause the timeline. You can play the timeline backwards. You can go to arbitrary points of the timeline. I didn't do that just for sake of simplicity here. It's something you can do. So you can just see I do the fade in with the opacity. My complete function then does both an X and a rotation Z uh, animation. And then I do the Y rotation at the end. So again, like I said, that's one of those things that just CSS doesn't do so hot on. And I've done some pretty complicated examples in some of our production code where like, I just I, I completely gave up on even trying to do it in CSS because it just wasn't worth it. Um, our UX was so specific about how it like, this part needed to throb as this thing was moving over here and then it scaled two times and just like, anyway. <laughs> also, if you've ever tried to translate and scale something at the same time, like using a, you know, CSS transforms, it's a disaster. <laughs> you, ba you, you basically end up doing the matrix math yourself. So the final example is this lots of properties. And this is another one, like I said, um, where GreenSock manages all the matrix math for you. So like I said, if you tried to scale and translate, or it, you know, because you basically start throwing off where it is because the scaling affects the translation. If you've never tried to do it, then be so grateful that you haven't. Um, but at a high level, you can just see that I can define lots of properties. So I'm using the same from to. I'm just I'm doing x, y, two different kinds of scale, two different kinds of skew, two different types of, types of rotation. And um, it, it just does all the magic for you. So uh, a bunch of examples just makes it really, really easy. Um, so any, any more questions up, up to this point? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So that's one of the ones I want to spend more time with. I mean, at a very simple level, I could, um, if I had modernizer here, I could write inside of my enter function. Um, again, you can't see me touching my screen. Right inside of my enter function, I could very simply just check to see if it was supported. And if it wasn't, I could make my JavaScript just bail. And then I could have a CSS class name that exactly matched. And then it would always only do one or the other. So if I was in IE9, it would only ever apply the JavaScript. All the other browsers would not apply the JavaScript, and they would just do the CSS animation. So it'd be, it'd be a pretty simple check that you'd have to add. I, I, it would be lovely to do it at a global level. I haven't thought that far through. Um, I don't know if anybody has any great ideas on that. But. Uh, and, and that was honestly one of the reasons I haven't spent a lot of time with it yet. That, that might diverge more down the road if the performance doesn't stay close. Um, and like I said, it really depends on the types of animations you're doing. If, if you are really like really good about just using, um, you know, basically anything that fits in the transform uh, property of, of CSS, you can kind of get away with most things in CSS, and it's probably always going to be faster. But as soon as you want to start animating heights and widths and you know multiple things at the same time, you kind of get yourself into trouble with CSS. Uh, it, like I said, my experience is that like, it, it's very comparable to CSS in most cases. Um, obviously, that's one of the biggest issues with mobile in general is that as soon as you go back three phones, you know, it's pretty bad. So that's always going to be a consideration as well. Um, but a lot of that might be just tailoring your design to have less animation or specific types of animation. I mean, it's really a, a, a use case on what you're trying to accomplish. And I could definitely see, like, even in our production app, I have a pretty healthy mix of CSS in these cases where I really don't care if this doesn't animate for somebody in IE9. I just don't care. Like, it'll work. But if they're in, you know, something current, it will look good and it will run fast. But then if, the, if it's a case of, like, this functionality is dependent on the animation succeeding, which we have some of those cases, I'll just make sure I use the, the JavaScript one always and then I can, it'll always be consistent for, for what I'm working on. Any other questions? Okay, that's it. Thanks, guys. another hand for our speakers. Really appreciate them coming out tonight. And uh, I sent out a link earlier, like a week or two ago. Um, if anyone's ever interested in speaking at the meetup, um, just fill out the little proposal and uh, we'll get you speaking if we can.
Uh, we're kind of backed up till probably July right now, so I'll just kind of give you an idea on time frame. But if you're interested, please let me know. Um, so I got two books from O'Reilly. First one I'll give away is uh, Learning JavaScript Patterns. And the other one is AngularJS. Um, I've got both those books. They're both great. Um, so I'm going to kind of do a little hack raffle here. I got the Meetup page here with all the RSVPs. And I wrote a little script that's going to query selector all those names and do a math random on it. It's the way JavaScript programmers do raffles, I guess. <laughs> so the first one is Jake Lingwall. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> Pass that back to him. And then I got Angular JS book. Oh, it's me. Yay. <laughs> Let's do it again. I didn't see the list, I promise. Um, Chad W T K N S. It's like all one word, it's like more of a handle than a name. Anybody know who that is? Okay, I'll try again. Third time's the charm. Simon, I don't have a last name. Is there more than one Simon? You guys have to duke it out if there is. All right, it's yours. So anyway, thanks everyone for coming out. We'll see you guys next month.